Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I am Heather Fass, Policy Advocacy Director at the Manitoba Eco Network and a PhD candidate at the University of Manitoba's Natural Resources Institute. And I'll be your moderator uh, for this event today. Thanks for joining us for the first event of the Navigating the Law Project Part 2. This project is a partnership between the Manitoba Eco Network the Public Interest Law Centre and the University of Winnipeg, and is funded by the Manitoba Law Foundation. Part two of the Navigating the Law Project will continue to the work we started in part one, and will focus on providing plain language information to activists, lawyers, students, and community members about a variety of environmental law topics through a series of educational events over the next six months. Recordings of our previous webinars and related materials are available on the Manitoba Eco Network website. Before I get into, <coughs> first, I'd like to acknowledge the ancestral lands that we are on today. For example, many of us are joining from Winnipeg, Manitoba, located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. From coast to coast, we acknowledge the shared and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this nation home. We also acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and the need to consider how we can each, in our own way, move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Today's webinar, titled Environmental Rights and Beyond, rights-based approaches to environmental protection, will explore different rights-based approaches such as environmental human rights, uh, indigenous rights, animal rights, and rights for nature, and their use as a legal tool to better protect the environment and empower Canadians to participate in environmental legal processes such as court proceedings. We have a wonderful group of panelists today uh, who I'll introduce next. First, we have Ian Meeret, who has been legal counsel at EcoJustice, Canada's largest environmental law charity since 2014. His practice focuses on environmental issues linked to air pollution and offshore oil and gas, as well as protecting marine environments and advancing the recognition of environmental rights in Canada. We also have Caitlin Mitchell with us, who's director of legal advocacy at Animal Justice, a national animal law advocacy organization. She has an extensive history of going to court to fight for environmental justice, as well as working to strengthen Canadian environmental laws and uses this expertise to enforce and strengthen Canada's animal laws. And finally, last but not least, we have Amy Kraft, who's an award-winning teacher, lawyer, author, and researcher, recognized internationally as a leader in the area of indigenous law, treaties, and maybe water. She is an associate professor at the Faculty of Common Law at the University of Ottawa and an Indigenous Anishinaabe Métis lawyer from Treaty 1 territory in Manitoba. Today, uh, the way this event is going to work is first, after a brief little introduction from myself, we're going to hear from each of our panelists. Then we're going to have a bit of a panel discussion and finally, uh, we are going to hopefully get some questions from the audience. Uh, we uh, are hoping that you'll be able to put your questions in the chat and we'll be watching from there. Um, although we did hear that there might be issues with that, but that is the plan that we are hopefully going forward with today. Um, so before I hand things over to Ian, who's going to be our first panelist, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the origins and potential benefits of rights-based legal approaches and why we're all here today. Um, so I've been studying and advocating for the recognition of environmental human rights in Manitoba for over a decade, starting out as a volunteer for the David Suzuki Foundation's Blue Dot Movement uh, over a decade ago. I've always been jealous of other jurisdictions in Canada, like Ontario and Quebec, that have recognized environmental human rights, giving citizens in these jurisdictions access to a much broader range of legal tools that can be used to protect the environment and human health. Throughout my legal and academic career so far, I am continued to be convinced that from an access to environmental justice perspective, 
that rights-based approaches are a way to expand can Canadian society and government's way of thinking about environmental legal approaches. They all have the potential to result in the development of legal processes that include a broader spectrum of people, ideas, methods, and outcomes. Rights-based approaches also create an opportunity to challenge the human-focused approach we see in most environmental legal regimes and require society to think about the rights and well-being of animals and natural entities themselves. So what's the current situation in Canada when it comes to legally recognized environmental rights? Uh, well, some jurisdictions in Canada, such as Ontario, Yukon, the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, Quebec, and most recently Prince Edward Island, have recognized environmental human rights through provincial law. This is where Ian's going to start the discussion with a focus on Ont Ontario's Environmental Bill of Rights and the legal tools it has made available to citizens in Ontario. Manitoba law, unfortunately, does not recognize environmental human rights, although there have been a number of attempts since the 1990s to formally recognize the environmental rights of Manitobans. However, there seems to be increasing interest in the adoption of environmental rights legislation in Manitoba once again, ideally through a standalone environmental bill of rights. Uh, so, for example, at the environmental election forum held in Manitoba at the end of August 2023, candidates from all participating parties uh, indicated their support for recognition of environmental human rights in Manitoba. Um, and the question specifically mentioned environment, an environmental bill of rights, and we have video proof of that support. Um, there's also been recent recognition of environmental human rights at the federal level through amendments to the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, and the federal government is currently starting to consult on what this new recognized right will mean for Canadians. So this renewed hope for recognition of environmental rights, both federally and in Manitoba, is what inspired me to organize this event. I'm fortunate to be working with a group of students right now at the Robson Hall Faculty of Law's Right Clinic to put together a vision of what we would like to see in environmental rights legislation in Manitoba, and there are some very exciting um, possibilities. Recognition of environmental human rights in law generally results in both substantive and procedural rights. Substantive rights include the fundamental rights that need protection, for example, a right to a healthy environment, a right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, which is the broader uh, articulation we've seen recognized internationally recently. Procedural rights are the legal tools created to protect substantive rights. These legal tools include requirements for improving public participation, giving citizens the ability to start court proceedings, facilitating access to information and can trigger government processes like investigations and the collection of data and evidence. Our panelists will speak more to some of the practical legal tools that legal recognition of environmental rights can create. However, there is still one major problem with focusing just on environmental human rights, and that's the fact that this type of legal framework still puts humans at the center of everything at the top of a hierarchy above other living entities and natural elements. When we are thinking about our ultimate vision of environmental rights in Manitoba and Canada more generally, we need to push beyond the normal human-centric focus of the law and imagine a new paradigm that also captures the rights of non-human entities and better incorporates Indigenous legal traditions. As Caitlin and Amy will discuss, there are other rights-based approaches that can help us push the boundaries of Euro-Canadian law and create environmental legal frameworks that are more inclusive and facilitate access to justice for all, not just human beings. Um, so Ian, uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you uh, and hear about the Ontario Environmental Bill of Rights and all of your exciting work. Thanks very much, Heather, and thanks for having me here today. It's really exciting to be able to talk about these things to uh, a group, uh, such a large group of folks. So thanks to everyone who uh, turned out today. I will be speaking about the Ontario Environmental Bill of Rights. I'm from Ontario, and most of my professional experience revolves around this particular law. And in my 
few minutes of time here, I'll, I, I just want to highlight some of the key tools that this law creates and take a quick look at some of the successes and failures of the law as it's been implemented so far. So for those of you who aren't familiar, the Ontario Environmental Bill of Rights is a pretty unique statute and it gives Ontario residents different tools to ensure environmental protection and to participate in and increase government accountability for environmental decision making. And the main idea that underlies the law is that more public input and more transparency drives better and more accountable government decisions, which in turn leads to better on the ground environmental protection. Uh, and it is a largely procedural law um, but it includes a lot of really interesting legal tools, including, you know, more soft law legal tools, which have the added benefit of being a lot more accessible for folks who don't have the time or money to go to court to enforce their rights. So, for example, under this law, people in Ontario have rights to participate meaningfully in important environmental decisions on things like permitting projects when the government is looking at changing laws and policies and that sort of thing. And they also have rights to receive information about those decisions to inform their participation and to, to make sure that it can be meaningful. Some of the other rights under this law include the right to seek permission to appeal certain permitting decisions if there's a chance that they could cause significant harm to the environment a right to ask the government to review existing policies, laws, regulations, or permits that relate to the environment, right, a right to ask the government to investigate suspected environmental offenses, and a right to sue to protect the environment where someone has broken or is about to break an environmental law, and this will cause significant harm to a public element of the environment. The Act also creates uh, an independent watchdog called the Environmental Commissioner, who oversees the operation of the law and reports publicly every year to drive some accountability that way. There are a number of other tools that I don't think we'll get into today in this act, including things like uh, expanded whistleblower protections and um, that sort of thing. So a lot of these happen outside of the legal system, there, there's no court involved, for example, in asking, a, uh, in asking a government to review its policies. So they are relatively accessible. And I think some of the major successes of this law include empowering people in Ontario to participate in this type of decision making. Uh, the, the comment writes, you know, thousands of people have been given a voice to participate in decision making every year. Uh, where they would not otherwise have been able to do that. So that that's significant. You know, it results in changes to legislation. It results in modifications to approvals. Uh, for instance, you know, um, restrictions were placed on a permit that let a multinational company withdraw water from a municipality's aquifer. So there are tangible on the ground environmental benefits of this statutory scheme and the tools that it creates. and. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, I think one of the biggest things this type of law does is to level the playing field to some extent between folks who live in a province and, you know, the people who come here to use our resources and, and to benefit from them. Uh, notwithstanding all these successes, there are a number of key issues with this law that have held it back from reaching its full potential. And a lot of those um, are kind of more technical that you know they there's problems with the implementation of the law by government departments so government departments are not disclosing the required information in time to inform meaningful comments on decisions uh, in some cases there's just outright non-compliance where decisions aren't posted uh, for comment and they just happen um, and you know that that may be uh, because of some of the limitations in the Ontario Environmental Bill of Rights, which, for example, say that it, it doesn't invalidate a decision if you don't comply with those notice and comment requirements. So, um, you know, I think one of the themes underlying the Ontario Bill is that 
the drafters wanted to rely on an idea of political accountability rather than accountability through the courts. And, uh, you know, with a thinking being that political accountability at the ballot box would be enough to drive compliance. And we're seeing that's not obviously uh, not entirely the case. Some of the other drawbacks that we've experienced include there are a lot of exceptions, probably too many exceptions to the participation rights, including some that have abu been abused um, by, by non-compliant departments. Uh, some of the other rights, like the right to uh, sue to protect the environment are extremely, extremely constrained. You know, there are short timelines for acting. There's a high standard to meet in court. Uh, there are risks of significant costs awards. And, and these limitations make them actually quite difficult and in some cases outright impossible to use in practice. Um, other, other implementation type problems include unwarranted delay. You know, a lot of times the government may be very slow in responding to requests for review. For example, um, recently Ontario reduced the powers of the independent watchdog, which um, of course undermines the accountability that that uh, institution can provide. And then I'll, I'll just close with the biggest problem, I think, which is that the Ontario law doesn't actually give people a substantive right to a healthy environment. There's no freestanding right to a clean and safe uh, environment in this law. It's just a bunch of procedural tools that can drive better environmental protection, but there's no um, standalone human right to a healthy environment in this law. Uh, I, I see I'm, I'm being, uh, my, my microphone's about to be cut off here. So I'll just leave it at that for now and uh, maybe we can come back to it in, in the discussion. Absolutely, thanks so much, Ian. Uh, Caitlin, you're next up, over to you. Great, thank you, Heather, and thanks, Ian, as well, for those remarks. Um, so I, I, I come here today mostly now um, my practice is focused on animal law, but I did previously practice environmental law. So um, environmental rights are something that is of interest to me um, in both of those respects. Um, so what I would say is that, you know, around the world, um, there are many approaches. I'm sorry, my dog is now shaking. There are many approaches toward enshrining legal recognition of animal rights. Um, and so some of the um, more traditional approaches would be things like endangered species laws or animal welfare laws. Um, and those aren't rights legislation in the sense of you know, giving animals or species legal personhood. Um, but you know, what they do is sort of implicitly recognize that at least some animals and some species um, have the right to be free from some very limited types of harm. So those laws are still quite anthropocentric. Um, animals and ecosystems are still treated as property under those laws, um, and they can and are used and exploited by humans. Um, but around the world, um, in other jurisdictions, there's also been a lot of development toward recognizing that some animals have legal rights that ought to be protected in law. And that can take many forms, but there's some really interesting case law in places like India and Pakistan and Argentina that has really started to shift the focus to the perspectives of animals as well. Um, some really interesting uh, case law in the US so far unsuccessful around habeas corpus um, litigation for animals, um, trying to you know, bring animals before the court to determine whether their imprisonment um, is lawful or not. Um, and as I said, so far those have not been successful. We haven't seen it in Canada, but all this to say there's there's many different approaches around the world. Um, but of course our focus today is on environmental rights and those are gaining legal recognition and even constitutional recognition around the world. And those can take many forms. Uh, we've heard already about the human right to a healthy environment, um, but there's also an increasing trend toward recognizing rights of nature, uh, which are independent of human interests. So over 110 countries, probably more in fact, because I, I, I can't even keep track of all the developments in this area, which is exciting. Um, but many recognize their citizens' right to a healthy environment, um, either in statutory law or in their constitution. Um, and again, there's this concept as well that nature can have legal rights and even personhood, and that is gaining momentum as well. 
So in some countries like Ecuador, we've seen rights of nature enshrined in their constitution. Um, and in other countries like Bolivia, there are statutory laws that enshrine um, rights of nature or Mother Earth in law. And then in other places, um, and I suspect we'll hear more about this as well shortly, but um, there's also been legal recognition of rights of nature that has resulted from the work of Indigenous peoples who have negotiated modern treaties. So I think probably many folks on this call will be familiar with New Zealand um, because that you know really made headlines around the world um, where both a river and a national park are now the subject of treaties that recognize that they have rights of legal persons. Um, and that happened because of negotiated agreements between the government and Maori peoples. Um, so some really exciting developments in those areas. And it's interesting too, when we think about rights of nature because you know it is a relatively new legal concept in the sense that I'm talking about it. Um, but of course, the ideas underlying these rights have a long history in indigenous cultures and legal systems uh, in Canada and around the world. So in countries with statutory or constitutional environmental protection provisions, we've seen some really exciting cases. Uh, Heather uh, mentioned some developments and improvements as well earlier. Um, but you know, we've seen some actual tangible benefits to the environment and animals, as well as local communities. Um, and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about some of those as the discussion continues. But I think um, you know, the main point for now, and something that gives me a lot of hope, is that until now, this was a trend that was really occurring in most other jurisdictions around the world, but not in Canada. Um, you know, and we still are quite far behind. But um, with the passing of Bill S-5 in June, um, and Bill S-5 amended our Canadian Environmental Protection Act, we do now have in federal law um, the right to a healthy environment recognized. Now, there is much that could be said about the way that that was done in SEPA, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. Certainly, it's not as strong as I know most of the groups and the individuals who are advocating would have wanted to see. Um, but I think that it is still a very important symbolic move, even though, again, you know, the way that the right is enshrined in that law, you know, arguably not super enforceable, but um, a, an important move nonetheless. And then finally, um, we do have also the Jane Goodall Act, which is slowly making its way through the legal process. And it recognizes um, the concept of all my relations, which um, you know includes an indigenous understanding that all life forms of creation are interconnected and independent. And so we do have these developments in Canada, which is really exciting to see. Um, and uh, I'm excited to see where it leads us. Thanks, Caitlin. I'm looking forward to digging more into some of that um, when you panelists get to discuss with each other. Um, Amy, over to you. Thanks, Heather, and thank you also to Ian and Caitlin for their remarks. Um, it's really difficult to tackle some of these issues in a in a short period of time. And one of the things that I I do want to say we haven't put squarely on the table is the exercise of treaty and Aboriginal rights and how some of this is contained in that constitutional framework and in inherent. Uh, rights of Indigenous peoples and in, in Indigenous legal frameworks, and that uh, that piece I'll speak a little bit to. But um, you know, there's there's a variety of different ways to approach this, and I want to focus a little bit more on uh, the idea of legal personhood and recognizing other than human or more than human um, interests, and uh, and I think that fits well with a lot of Indigenous legal frameworks that that focus and center on cores of relationality or relationship and also ensuring collective well-being. So, uh, you know, I approach it kind of in that way. And as Caitlin mentioned, sort of the evolution of those um, um, schools of thought or philosophies and then the actionability of rights of nature and uh, secondly, legal personhood as giving effect to rights of nature. So rights of nature being kind of the whole that fits a little bit more with the idea of um, rights to healthy environment and the human right to healthy environment. And, um, but thinking then about the rights of a global environment to legal personhood, which is actually given effect more to uh, bodies of water or a park in the case of um, the New Zealand um, Te Arawura example. So, 
how do we actually do that? I mean, we've heard about legislation, constitutional recognition. Those are some of the core approaches. Um, settlement of treaty litigation. So the, the famous example that Caitlin spoke to of the Wanganui River being recognized um, is it actually flows from a dispute and um, settlement of a claim that was before the Waitangi Tribunal. So thinking about the Maori interest and rights that set the stage for recognition of some type of environmental right. And that's not uncommon. Indigenous protection of rights, Indigenous philosophy, law, governance is often the foundation for recognition of either environmental, sorry, rights of nature or um, of personhood rights. And that's been the case in multiple examples. Uh, core examples relating to personhood of water bodies, uh, including, as we said, New Zealand Aotearoa, the Wanganui River, the Maori leading that, uh, local Indigenous communities and other communities um, of minorities in India and Bangladesh in the recognition of rights, as well as in uh, Colombia, uh, mostly Afro-Colombian Indigenous communities being recognized as guardians or guardianes of the Atrato River. So this, uh, you know, this philosophical foundation of um, governance and application of Indigenous legal systems through Western legal mechanisms like legal personhood is uh, gaining traction. And so the, the means by which to do that, legislation, uh, settlement of agreements, the Maori example picks up on those two, constitutional recognition, uh, judicial decision making, and that's the case with um, India, we're looking at decisions by, uh, by courts. Uh, same in Colombia with constitutional uh, court recognition. Then we have some indigenous mechanisms that come into play, like declarations, bylaws that um, that recognize the personhood of different water bodies or of water itself. Which you know we can imagine the jurisdictional thinkers here are saying, "Oh, how do we actually capture rights of water when it takes so many forms and it doesn't observe geopolitical boundaries?" or um, you know, really uh, lend itself well to single source management. And that becomes the big, the big question, right? The interjurisdictional collaboration to give these rights of nature or legal personhood some type of effect. And I wanna underline with the time that I have just one example, um, that of the Magpie River in Canada where there's a collaboration between a municipality and the First Nation to develop uh, sister resolutions. So they sit side by side, they recognize each other's jurisdiction and authority as being separate from one another, but they ultimately declare the same nine rights of the Magpie River. So they're identical to one another, sitting side by side in recognition and building uh, up the guardians that uh, are to enforce those rights. So, you know, that may be uh, given effect then through some kind of uh, judicial decision making. It could potentially be given effect through legislation. And so I see, you know, the potential for something similar in Manitoba with some of our major waterways, many of which are affected by hydroelectric development. Um, and same with Lake Winnipeg. And uh, I know that the Lake Winnipeg Indigenous Collective has been considering legal personhood as a potential opportunity for uh, a declaration of the um, of the state of the uh, the lakes um, recognition by their nations, the nation partic participants in Lake Winnipeg Indigenous Collective. Um, and I would say that now is the time, this is a very unique opportunity that we have. It's a, it's a watershed moment, if you think about it that way, uh, with a Canada Water Agency that has been announced, that's being established, uh, in Winnipeg, and uh, the potential for a renewed Canada Water Act and a new freshwater action plan. So Canada is situating itself um, in um, an ethos of collaboration, of interjurisdictional collaboration and coordination, which will include coordination on some of those procedural aspects that have already been mentioned, data collection, ensuring that the substantive rights of citizens, and if you think and adopt sort of the indigenous and legal personhood approach, the rights of water uh, bodies themselves, 
that they can be accounted for in any process that's being developed. And so, um, you know, my thought is enhanced uh, attention to both process and substance, as Heather and Ian have already mentioned, and great opportunity for uh, meaningful change. Thanks so much for all those presentations and the amount of stuff all three of you managed to capture in them. Uh, it's a good thing my screen wasn't on because I was just sitting there with a big goofy smile on my face. Um, so before we get into the discussion between our panelists, uh, I just want to mention to the audience that we realize that the chat is disabled. Um, and so when we get to the audience questions part, we will uh, likely just have you raise your hand and then people will be able to ask their question uh, directly. So that will happen a little bit later, but we are aware the the chat is not working. Um, so Caitlin and Ian, if you wanna turn your screens on, uh, I do have a set of kind of basic questions we talked about earlier, but I just wanted to throw it out to the three of you uh, to see if there was something that you wanted to start off this panel discussion with that came up um, in the three wonderful presentations we just heard. Anyone have a burning question they want to ask a different panelist? Okay, well, not hearing anything. Uh, I think what would be very interesting to hear, considering uh, the kind of inspiration for this event is thinking about um, what environmental rights legislation or recognition of these different rights-based approaches might look like is uh, what uh, do you think, or what would you like to see um, in environmental rights legislation or whatever legal approach we take to recognize environmental rights. So that includes like best practices or ideal elements. I think that's a really uh, great starting point. Ian, do you wanna go first since um, you were giving us all of those great elements of Ontario's Environmental Bill of Rights? What would you add that Ontario does not have? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think Ontario's approach was groundbreaking when it was done which was 30 years ago, and things have changed a lot in 30 years. Um, you know, all of the stuff Aimee and Caitlin spoke about uh, has evolved considerably since since that time, and it's not really reflected in the Ontario statute. So I think, um, you know, in terms of best practices, I think the Ontario statute provides a useful example of some tools that could be included in a Manitoba bill, but it is definitely not uh, the be-all and end-all and, and I think a lot of thought would need to go into uh, incorporating some of those new concepts, you know, more of a, a reconciliation based approach. I mean, I don't, I, I'm not sure how extensively, if at all, um, Indigenous groups in Ontario were consulted when, when the EBR came into force here, which is obviously a non-starter now. Um, and, and I think, you know, bringing all, all of these groups into the same room to to conceptualize what best practices might include. Um, I think that's a necessary first step here. Excellent. Caitlin, do you have something to add? Sure. Um, yeah, it's exciting. It's definitely exciting to think about. And, and it sounds like there's some real opportunity here now. So I think um, I would agree with what Ian said. Um, you know, I think for me, I, I I would like to see in addition to the human right to a healthy environment, which I think um, I don't want to underplay how challenging it can be to get that enshrined in law because we just saw that it was, it was really challenging. But like public opinion is there on that one. Like it's not actually as controversial as some of the other stuff. I think, you know, the polling is like 90% of Canadians believe that they should have a right to a healthy environment. So it's it's one of those things that seems like um you know, there's there's some public support there. If we could see the recognition of that in law in Manitoba, I think that would be great, but I'd love to go a little bit further and, and additionally see um, some recognition of rights of nature, whatever that looks like. Um, because I think, you know, not only can that have direct benefits for animals and for the natural environment, um, you know, speaking as an animal lawyer, I think it also is a way to kind of get the public and the judiciary and government a little bit more familiar and comfortable with the notion of non-humans having rights, including legal person to potentially 
but you know, I, I kind of think of it as a bit of a gateway right in that way. Um, so I think that there would be some tangible direct benefits, but that I think it would just also set our law um, in a really good direction, um, both for humans and for animals. Um, and then if, like from, you know, a drafting standpoint, I think there's lots to say as well, you know, things like non-regression, uh, it would be great to have that in environmental Bill of Rights in Manitoba, an environmental statute, which is basically a concept from human rights law that says that you can't detract from the existing level of rights. And I think that's incredibly important in the environmental field because we see time and time again that governments um, can simply um, take away environmental protections that already exist. Um, and of course, environmental justice too, which is something that um, I, we haven't, I guess, focused on as much today, but but really recognizing that it's not, um, the burden's not shared equally amongst Manitobans, just like it's not shared equally across Canada, or around the world, um, disproportionately environmental harms and hazards fall on communities who are, um, you know, First Nations or um, communities that may be of, you know, uh, smaller financial means than other communities. Um, so, you know, recognizing this disproportionate harm and these layers of challenges that certain communities are facing, I think, would be incredibly important in Manitoba, too. Anyway, I, I have lots to say. I'll cut myself off and make room for Ameda to, to jump in. <laughs> Great thoughts to date. And I would say, um, to answer directly your question, Heather, um, absolutely requirements for inclusion would be the principles articulated in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So that as a foundation to what a healthy environment looks like um, uh, would be requiring free prior and informed consent of Indigenous people uh, relating to any use of lands, territories, waters, um, but also that inherent recognition of two things, the right to create institutions or to use institutions of decision making that are indigenous. And secondly, the recognition of that spiritual connection to those lands and the right to preserve it for future generations. Um, I think it's interesting that you mentioned Blue Dot earlier because I sat in a room with David Suzuki and said, what you're proposing is not that novel. It's actually um, inherently built into indigenous uh, laws and governance. And actually, if you dig further, it would be constitutionally protected as a treaty and Aboriginal right. So there's, I think, already some uh, openness within our constitutional framework um, and the international Indigenous uh, rights recognition framework for the things that, that we're talking about. Um, associated with that, I think, you know, more directly recognition of Indigenous legal orders, as I said, process and substance. Uh, and I think that one thing that uh, environmental rights legislation would need to do is think seriously about definitions of terms. Um, and I agree with Caitlin on the non-regression piece. Uh, a lot of how we protect now is based in conservation and the conservation movement, which is really disaligned, I think, with a lot of what, what we're um, proposing as you know, these environmental rights uh, within this conversation. And one last thing, very quickly, I would make some space for um, consideration of different forms of data and the need for data collection and some mechanisms of uh, data analysis that would be built into either legislation or sent off to, um, to regulation. But I think that those are key components of principled decision making that often lack in our different uh, spheres of governance, especially relating to water currently. Wonderful ideas. I hope to see all of these things in Canadian law eventually. Um, so maybe uh, moving to a different question. I know all of you mentioned examples um, of rights-based approaches of all of these different approaches being used. But do you have um, any particular success stories you can share where rights-based approaches have been successfully used? Who are the people involved? And what were the kind of successes that were achieved? Um, I think all of us would like to hear some positive examples of what we hopefully can see in the future here in Canada. Um, anyone want to go first with an example? I'll give one. Um, I really love what White Earth 
uh, nation has done in the United States. They've actually declared the rights of Minoman, uh, their wild rice, and they've taken kind of one tranche of jurisdiction, which is wild rice, which I don't think is competing jurisdiction. I don't think the state or the federal government really are, uh, you know, jumping or chomping at the bit to assert their jurisdiction jurisdiction over wild rice. And within that um, that declaration, they've built in a whole framework for recognition of environmental rights that are attached to the rights of the rice itself. So building out this framework of whole ecosystem recognition around this one relative of theirs and in a sphere where they they clearly have that authority to uh, to legislate or, or to um, to make a legal declaration. So uh, to me, that's a very interesting approach and one to to take seriously. I agree. That's an excellent example. Ian or Caitlin, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I can. I'm happy to jump in. I think one case um, that I'm really excited about that was fairly recent was um, a case um, involving a woolly monkey named Estralita. And it um, occurred in Ecuador, where, as I mentioned earlier, there is this constitutional recognition of rights of nature. Um, and it was a really interesting case. It's sort of sad, um, the fact situation, this monkey, um, Estralita, had probably been poached from the wild as a baby. Um, so she'd been living with a woman in a private home for something like 18 years. At some point, somebody uh, reported her to authorities because it is not um, allowed in Ecuador, as most places, to um, be keeping a wild animal as a companion animal. And um, so Estralita was taken from uh, this woman's home and brought to a zoo. And so um, her human caregiver um, brought uh, habeas corpus action. So um, an interesting angle, but basically a challenge to the lawfulness of Estralita's imprisonment at this zoo. Um, so this was something that, you know, I, I mentioned it's happened in the U.S. There have been several habeas corpus cases, um, not super successful, although, you know, making some progress. Um, but this was the first in Ecuador. Um, and so the interesting piece as well is that little did um, her caregiver know at some point Estralita died. Um, so there was actually no live body. Um, to really be the subject of a habeas corpus case, and yet even despite that fact, um, Ecuador's constitutional court agreed to take on this case to develop jurisprudence on rights of nature and animal rights. Um, so that on its own, I find really exciting and promising that the court had that interest. Um, but, you know, there are many questions at play here, and, you know, you can do um, you know, we could probably speak for hours about the case because it was so interesting. But I think one piece that I find very interesting is that, um, you know, when we think about rights of nature at large, you know, sometimes we talk about personhood for a specific body of water um, or some specific entity, but rights of nature at large are generally seen as, you know, at the species level or a little bit broader. And so in this case, they really had to grab, um, grapple with the question of, you know, do rights of nature protect individuals? And the court ultimately found that um, that they did. And so they agreed that Astralita was a subject of rights um, that were protected through this rights of nature provision. Um, so, you know, although the habeas corpus was inadmissible because she had died, um, it really set the groundwork for the recognition that rights of nature can um, actually protect individual animals. And I think just, you know, from um, an academic standpoint, that makes sense. Because if you're going to protect a species, um, of course, the species is made up of individuals and harm to one of those individuals can harm others in the population in, in many ways, um, whether disrupting social patterns or, um, you know, resulting um, in changing dynamics that affect the viability of specific populations or species. Um, but it was really exciting to see the court in Ecuador really clearly say that, you know, this individual, Estralita, um, did have rights and that those are a component of rights of nature. So um, I think we're a ways off in Canada from getting there, but um, it's something to, to be hopeful about. Excellent. Very interesting example. 
And Ian, did you want to add anything about some of the um, court cases that have been happening in Ontario related to environmental rights or based on environmental rights legislation? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's been a number of court cases in Ontario challenging the government's non-compliance with the Bill of Rights. Some of those have been partially successful and some of those have not been successful. Um, and it's interesting, right? Like it, it, you know, you can go to court and you can get the court to agree that the government broke the law. That doesn't necessarily give you a remedy, right? Other than, you know, being declared right. Uh, and it, it can be pretty tricky to, to get the court to go beyond that type of remedy and, and give you something substantive. Um, and I think a lot of that reflects the fact that there is no substantive right in Ontario's law, uh, which is a big gap. And, and if that was filled, then you might see a little bit more uh, toothy enforcement where the government is falling short of its obligations. Great. Any, any final thoughts from the panelists before we open it up for questions from the audience? Okay, uh, if anyone in the audience has a question, um, you can just raise your hand and we will hopefully give you the ability to speak. And here we go. MJ, if you wanna unmute. I just have a couple of questions. Um, I really like the idea of a, a a Bill of Rights and working on that for Manitoba. Um, but what happened to um, issues like hydroelectric power damage for, you know, to the rivers, uh, pollution to Lake Winnipeg that happened before the Bill of Rights come into effect? Does it cover? Do you then have a chance to go back and, and uh, advocate for past harms or is it only from that time forward? Anyone have any thoughts on that? I, I uh, maybe everyone will laugh because this is a very lawyer answer, but I think it'll depend on how, on how you, uh, how you draft the bill. I think it theoretically is possible to make bills apply retroactively. Um, obviously that takes a much greater degree of political will to do. Uh, and, and yeah, there would have to be some thought given to how that would work in practice. Yeah, and I think that leads to the the important connected question of, you know, what are the the standards? What are the actual um, benchmarks? And uh, that can be, a, I think, a challenging um, thing to approach. And I, you know, the reality is in Manitoba, Manitoba Hydro is a crown corporation, so uh, and there are some existing agreements with the First Nations that were directly impacted. So there may be opportunity in that case to reopen some of those uh, historic pieces of, um, of, of settlement. They're considered to be modern day treaties, the Northern, Northern Flood Agreement uh, and their implementation agreements. So uh, something very important to, to consider as part of the mix in Manitoba. Thanks for the question. Caitlin? Yeah, um, I think all that I would add, um, would be to say that I think, you know, another piece that um, I didn't mention, you know, when we were talking about what would be included in a Manitoba statute, um, I think cumulative effects are incredibly important. And I think that they're important for a number of reasons, but partly they help to get at some of that um, existing pollution. So, you know, in a pristine lake, perhaps, you know, allowing one new development, you know, whether it's a pulp and paper mill or whatever it might be, a peat mine, um, you know, perhaps that's not going to have lake-wide effects. But if you're looking at Lake Winnipeg um, and you're looking at a situation of basically death by a thousand cuts, then that is another tool to say, you know, the, the lake just can't take it. And so that even if it's a challenge to um, a new development um, or, you know, commenting on a new development or whatever tool you're using, um, the existing level of harm and the existing level of pollution can come into play and can be incredibly relevant. Um, okay, thanks so much for your answers. And Christina, question from you. Hi, uh, thanks everybody for your um, uh, time. and. 
um, the insight into this topic. I'm very interested to know if there's anybody in Manitoba who's currently interested in, you know, um, working towards advocating for this type of legislation. I was involved with this maybe about 10 years ago on the Manitoba Roundtable for Sustainable Development. And at that time, we did have some draft legislation, um, but of course it didn't go through. But um, yeah, just curious if anybody is currently um, working on that and um, yeah, who might be interested. Um, so that may actually be a question for me. Um, so I would say absolutely there are people working on this right now. The Manitoba Eco Network um, has been engaged in, uh, like Caitlin was and her organization, in doing some work with the federal uh, right to a healthy environment recognized in SEPA. And we have some excellent community members we've been working with in Winnipeg as well that are very interested um, in environmental rights. I also mentioned in my intro that we have some uh, law students working on drafting legislation, and I know uh, at least one or two of the panelists on this call also previously have done some work on this. So I would say, uh, Christina, that there are lots of people that are interested and actively working on this. So um, if you wanted to connect with the Eco Network, we can definitely uh, connect you with others that are doing work in this exciting area. Excellent question. Uh, I think, yeah, we have time for one more question from Vicki, please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, I'm a board member with the Manitoba Eco Network. So I just want to uh, say thank you so much, Heather, for all you're doing and to the panelists. And definitely there's interest from the board of the Eco Network on pursuing this. Um, but I'm just wondering whether you can make any comment on whether this um, rights-based legislation, could we try to apply that to uh, industrial agriculture, to uh, both the uh, animals, the millions of animals that are subjected to um, inhumane treatment, in my view, in industrial agriculture, and the surrounding communities that are subjected to the pollution that comes from um, uh, intensive barns? Um, yeah, I'm happy to to start off. Um, and thank you for the question, Vicky. As as you've probably gathered, because I know we've we've met a couple of times now, that's an area of particular interest to me, um, both as an animal lawyer and also as someone who lives in Manitoba. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I guess from the animal standpoint, you know, I think for me that's why cases like Estrelita are so interesting um, because it does suggest, and, and that's just one example, there have been cases in other jurisdictions that have um, you know, recognized that rights to uh, nature or even environmental rights, the right to a healthy environment um, can have implications for animals. And, and so you know, when I think about environmental rights or rights of nature as this kind of gateway right, that's kind of the end result that I'd love to get to. I think that probably there would be some openness eventually again like I realize this is going to take a while but to you know like let's say caribou right it's this iconic species in Canada having some legal recognition and I think that's important in its own right but then once you're at the point where an ungulate like caribou has legal rights why not a cow um and so that's you know a question for like way down the road but I do think that um you know perhaps in the long run but certainly not like I don't think anyone's jumping no one's jumping there in Canada right now that would be a long road um, but I would hope that there'd be benefits um, for communities um, who are living next to these facilities, because I think there are also really important human health and human rights implications as well. Um, and part of it, I think, would have to be like, you know, looking at what tools are in place, because, you know, some of what Ian was talking about was, you know, I think like a right to review, for instance, right to review existing laws and say that they're inadequate, that could be helpful. Um, but some of some of the most important work in Ontario has been around challenging new approvals and our approval scheme is kind of lacking in Manitoba. So I think some of those hooks are missing, but I think that, um, that I think, you know, there are creative ways to think about it. And I think it could be an interesting tool for communities living near facilities and also just to protect like Winnipeg and other um, aspects of the environment that are impacted. Thanks, Caitlin. Anyone else want to jump in there? Okay, well, unfortunately, MJ, we don't have time for another question from you, but we will be happy to chat more about this 
in future events and perhaps um, offline. Um, are there any final thoughts or comments that the panelists want to make before I end things off? Nope. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much to our panelists for being with us uh, here today. And I hopefully will have future conversations with you about um, what is basically my favorite topic, as my students know. Uh, and thanks to all of our attendees for joining us today. The recording for this event and the other materials uh, related to this event will be available on the Manitoba Eco Network website. More information about upcoming events, like the in-person gathering we're planning to have on November 18th, can be found on the Manitoba Eco Network website and will be included in upcoming uh, Eco Network publications. A survey link will be email emailed to all of you after the webinar finishes with some more information about uh, future events in this project. Please fill it out so we can get feedback on today's event and also hear from you about topics you'd like to see discussed in the future. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. And I look forward to many uh, future excellent discussions on this topic and other exciting environmental law issues. Thanks so much, everyone.